the 21st chapter. Jesus appeared by the Sea of Galilee to his disciples, Simon Peter, Thomas, known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, and from that time they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. However, the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you any fish? No. He said, throw out, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple Jesus loved told Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he put on his garment and jumped in the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net. When they landed, they saw a fire burning coals there. The fire had fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some fish you just caught. So Simon and Peter, on the back of the boat, dragged the net ashore, full of 153 large fish, but they did not care. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask for two parties. They knew it was the Lord Jesus came and took the bread. He gave it to them, and he was the same with the fish. This was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, Lord Jones, do you love me more than me? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon Barjona, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And a third time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Then Jesus told him, Follow me. I heard a funny joke this morning. This, this little kid named Sammy took some money that he saw sitting on the pastor's desk. And he felt so horrible about it, he went back and he told the pastor, I stole some money. Oh, Sammy, the pastor said, that's wrong. You have to give it back. Well, do you want it? No. I said, give it back to the person. Well, I tried, but they didn't want it. Well, then the pastor said, I guess you can keep it. <laughs> I don't know why that's one. It's an odd story. So love one another is our topic of the sermon. It's what Jesus did today in the reading. It's what he asked Peter three times. Love one another is also the commandment he gives at the Maundy Thursday in John, where the Last Supper would normally be. And it was the theme this week of our 2019 National Day of Prayer. Christians all over America, from the very edge of Maine to the islands of Hawaii, sponsored ecumenical and even interfaith, that means with other religions, public prayer events that were attended by everybody from the president on down to regular people like us. And our focus this year was love one another. But that's not easy, otherwise it wouldn't be a focus. When I teach the business or econ classes, I often have to distinguish the advice I give them business-wise, and I say, well, this is not Jesus' advice, but it's not the smart thing to do to love people but it is the wise thing to do. And there are two habits that will help us love one another. One, staying connected, and two, staying content. Today in our reading, Jesus' disciples had had a bewildering week. And I don't know about you, but a lot of us have had bewildering weeks over the course of the last few months. Their Lord was convicted of a crime, stripped, beaten, publicly ridiculed, and executed. The people voted on his execution. He went from the most popular person in town to the most despised. Then he rose from the dead. Some of their numbers, some of the ladies told them they didn't believe him. Some of the people saw him and didn't tell anybody. 
And finally, he appeared to the disciples, and I'm not sure that all of them could believe it as well. So how did they respond to all of this? They got in the boat and they went fishing together. This is a symbol for us staying connected to church no matter what happens. Our sanctuary, as I often and always say, as a proper church should be, is shaped like an upside-down boat. Like that's the bottom, and that's why we call the seating area the nave. When we say sanctuary, this is actually the sanctuary up here. And the pulpit, the edge of the nave, the edge of the sanctuary, just like a ship will have a nave, and then the prow that sticks out, they call that the pulpit. That's right here between the two. Last month, as part of our history trivia series, I mentioned in the sermon how people used to go to church all day long. And if the pastor didn't preach a full hour, he didn't get paid the full price. It is still a good practice to get in the boat with the other disciples and just stay the whole day, stay the whole night. I don't know how many have had those kind of religious experiences where you go away on a women's retreat with other congregational women or you do something. You're just soaking it in with other Christians. You can do that today after worship. You know, I mentioned that we have Phil Kaufman's Cotton Patch Gospel here at 2.30. And the Apollo Movie Theater is showing a Christian movie today called Breakthrough. You can either go at 11.45 before the Cotton Patch and after church assuming you don't have to have Cinco de Mayo Mexican lunch, so I don't know how busy your schedule is. And then they're showing it again at 2.15 and at 4.30 and at 7.15, so you got a lot of chances, but it's the only week. And it's about this teenager, true story, who fell through the frozen ice and died. And they brought the child out, pronounced them dead, but something happened and the child came back to life. So it's a very heart-rending, touching movie. But you, like Peter, can just... Also, not only be in the boat, you can go out and do things like that. You can jump in the water. One of the reasons why we need to stay active and part of the church, we talked about last week, our main job, if we have a job, is to bring other people to Christ. And that's a team effort. It's too big. It's too difficult for one person. I mentioned last week the Bible says you and I have to be wise to win souls. But we have to be loving to be willing to stay in the church, in the church boat, and that is even wiser. Jesus said before his death and resurrection, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you stay joined with me and I stay joined to you, you will produce much fruit, but you cannot do anything without me. Jesus is asking a personal question there. He's asking you and me to make him a priority, to have a constant contact throughout the day, daily devotions, weekly worship as part of Jesus' body, the church. And the deal is that when we do stay connected, we will produce much fruit. So a good rule of thumb is if your ministry or your life is not producing much fruit, it's probably because there's a sin or a blockage or a disconnection between you and your relationship with God. So how do you stay connected and see that abundant life, that complete joy, that peace that passes understanding that Jesus has for every single one of you and wants you to have? It's not by staying by ourselves, even though that gives us fleeting pleasure. It's not real peace or real joy because life is meant to be lived together. The disciples taught us that that very first night they went fishing. So if you go through life on your own, you're going to be overwhelmed at some point. Toasters can't even fill their function unless they're plugged in. You and I cannot find, let alone fulfill, our purpose in life without Jesus. Unless you think our purpose is something simple, like make sure we eat every day and put our pants on and you know make enough to pay the, the bills. But we know that's not the real meaning of life. So one habit that helps us stay connected is the other. Stay content. The disciples did not understand everything that crazy week. They had lost everything. And to the best of their knowledge, they probably felt like they were having a mental health crisis. They had a group vision of seeing this person who clearly had died, and were they even really sure it had happened? The Bible says that some of them still doubted, even on the final day of Jesus' ascension. They didn't understand everything, but they were content. So they went fishing together. I'm going to talk about three things real briefly, three ways that contentment helps us. Contentness 
lets us choose agreement over arguing. They could have debated the next steps. They said, well, you know, now we've got to appoint a leader. Somebody's got to fill that committee position. They could have complained about the unfairness of Jesus, the way they've been treated. They could have complained about how Jesus wasn't with them anymore. If he's really God and if he's really alive, why is he not here right now, today? But the very first Bible verse I shared with our church 120 sermons ago when I came was that we replace our grumbling with gratitude. Philippians 2.14 says, Do everything without arguing or complaining. You know, the medical studies have shown that complaining makes us unhealthy, but being grateful makes us healthier because it sends our brain... Now, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not even going to look at the, the nurses in the room, but it sends us serotonin and dopamine and oxytocin, things like that, that lower stress and increase our happiness. The disciples didn't complain about having no sleep. They didn't complain about having no fish. They didn't argue with Peter. They simply agreed and went together. And that togetherness, that thankfulness, is embodied in a Greek word that many churches use as the name for Holy Communion. It's the word Eucharist. It means good grace. God sends us so many good graces. He sends us His very body and His blood in this meal. He sends us His Spirit he sends us His Word. He sends us each other. You know, my mom and Stan came to visit last week, and they loved this church. They loved the worship service. Uh, they loved Princeton. I, my mom's not a shopper, and she spent like four hours at Hoffman's. She bought so many things, I'm afraid to ask. God sends us so many gifts, and we all have gifts to share. I don't know if you've noticed, but nobody comes into these doors unless they do something. Everybody is, has some sort of job that they're doing. And the church is sent... By God, the Bible says He sends us pastors and teachers. He sends us Peters. He sends us me's. Some of them, may, we may think, ah, oh, they're too young. Ah, oh, they're too old. They're not educated enough. They're too educated. They're in the community too often. They spend too much time with just the members. It's easy to never be satisfied with the things that we have in life. But it's a lot easier to be grateful that God sends us so many gifts to share. The second way contentment helps us is it helps us be generous. Malachi said, bring in your full tithes so there's plenty for all. Test me. It's the only place in the Bible where God says test me and it's about money. Test me and see if I don't open the windows of heaven and pour bless abundant blessings on you. We here in Illinois, and you will sometime have to explain to me why our ancestors chose to move from beautiful Europe to come all the way to Illinois in all the places in America they could have parked and farmed. They decided to be in a place that has two seasons. I bought, for my other office, I bought a picture of these three cows. It just captured my attention. I was at Atkinson Church. Is that a town or a church? At some little shop. And I just saw it on the ground. I loved it. These cows just have this wise expression on their face like, we know what everything's about. And there's this gentle snow falling. And I thought, how perfect for Illinois because the school year I teach mainly from September through May, and it could be snowing any of those months at all. But I'm committed. Worrying about whether we have enough is just as useful as worrying about the weather in Illinois. It'll keep us locked away. Um, Sheila and I were talking about when you're in a place where the weather is warm, you just feel like going out and walking more. When we have those warm breaks, I'll go running every day. I love it. It's something about the environment. But that coldness, that concern, oh, I'm going to be chilly, it stops us from giving ourselves away. Love is something that gives itself away. Love does not... Love you can't store in a battery. You can't store it in a bank account. You can't intend to love someone. Love only occurs when it's actually given. It's like music. It only happens when the sound, hap when sound goes out. This week, I can't stop thinking about um, this shooter who entered UNC Char Charlotte College and uh, entered a classroom, and there's this young, handsome man named Riley Howell who was an ROTC cadet. And when he saw the gunman enter his classroom, he died from a point-blank shot because he immediately charged the gunman and tackled him. He tackled the murderer and gave his classmates time to escape, and it gave the police an opportunity to apprehend the assailant. I can't think of any greater love than that. God has wired the law of the whole universe to be more love we give, 
the more love we have to give away. Why did He do this? It's one of the secrets of everything. He did it so you can be like Him. God is love. God is a giver. Everything we have is a gift from God. We just talked about that. Communion and our money and this building and our lives and our friends and our family and our breath, our ideas. It's all from Him. And He doesn't keep any of it for Himself. He gives it away to us. And that's His glory and His joy. The third thing that contentment gives us is it helps us to stop the deadly sin of comparing. God is not concerned about who has the nicest car or which church has more cars in the parking lot. He cares about how much we care about others, how much love we have in our heart. It's better to be content, the Bible says, with a little. Otherwise, you will always be chasing after the wind because there's never enough. Everybody on Facebook looks at their, like they're happier than you. Contentment does not ask us to abandon ambition. It just takes away the burden of having to compare ourselves, what do other people want me to be? If as many hats in life as I wear, if I had to worry all the time about what other people do better than me or what other people want me to do, I would go crazier than I already am. We have to make, of course, the best of whatever God gives us, but contentment lets us be happy with wherever we are at that moment. Sure, we're not perfect, and sure, we want to be better, but we're happy now. Contentment does not depend on our circumstances. Contentment depends on God. There was a wise man who was at a kind of a confrontational meeting, and so he cracked a joke, eased the tension. Everybody laughed, and later on, things got a little rough. He said the exact same go joke. Well, a couple of people chuckled. But as the meeting wound down and there was no resolution to the disagreement, the wise man made the same joke a third time, and nobody even smiled. At that point, he looked up and he said, How can you not laugh at the same joke that brought you joy, but you can cry on and on about the same complaint? We need to be wiser. We need to be wiser, and Jesus' church is the best place to become wiser. Every church only has five purposes on earth. We're not a membership club. We're not a business. We are doing here to do five things. Worship, instruction, service, evangelism, and relationships. And all of these depend on love. Think about how Peter jumped in the water out of the boat. It had to have been cold. I don't know how warm it is there, but he was Pretty much buck naked, wasn't he? He said he put on a garment and he jumped in the water. What would make you jump out of a boat? What would make you jump into the water? Maybe if the boat was sinking or it was on fire, but there's only one thing, love. It's like the paratroopers used to say, why would we jump out of a perfectly good airplane? Because Peter loved God. That's what worship is, the first goal of the church. Loving God with all our heart and our, all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength. It's like being a sports team fan times 100. You really just want to worship God. And then Jesus asked him to bring some fish. That's worship too, our offering. Peter went, we give our time, we give our talents, we give our treasure. And one thing you may not notice is you give your touches. I've noticed more and more as I get older that touching people, a hug, giving them your attention, showing them that love is also truly a great treasure that you share. Peter went to get fish from the, the net. 153, that's a good number for a church, right? I don't think that number is... John is not the most scientific mathematical person. So when he throws out 153 out of the blue, it kind of means something. I kind of think 153 is a good goal for a church. And what Peter gives Jesus is weird. He gives Jesus fish, and Jesus already had fish and bread cooking. He didn't need the fish. And Peter gives him the fish that Jesus told them how to catch. They're the expert fishermen. They fished all night and had bumpkus, nothing. For those of us that have been in big churches and little churches, we know the frustration of doing everything right, everything God wants us to, and not catching any fish. But Jesus says, just fish on the other side, and bam, they had all that fish. So what was the point of Jesus asking Peter to go get something that Jesus gave Peter 
that Jesus already had. The act of giving is the act of worship. It's where we bring what God first gave us. And it's also why Jesus asked Peter three times that same irritating question. Peter, son of Jonah, bar Jonah, son of John, do you love me? This week I was listening to our Orthodox priest in the area. He's a wonderful guy, Father Andrew. And he was joking about the Orthodox church services. He says they love the Trinity so much that they repeat almost everything three times. So a one-hour church service lasts them three hours every time they get together. So let's notice how Jesus responded to Peter's love. And because they cover the other purposes that each church in the world has. Worship, instruction, service, evangelism, and relationship. Wiser. He said, feed my lambs. That's evangelism. My little baby lambs. These, these little kids who come to kids' club. The people in your life that don't know Jesus. Or they believe in God, but their, their fires have died down cold. Or these writers who have a dream to be a writer. All these people, we are feeding these little lambs. Evangelism. Then he said, take care of my sheep. And that covers two things. We take care of each other in our relationships. And we take care of others outside the church in our service. And then he said, feed my sheep. Discipleship. Training. What we call instruction is the key. The word disciple means to be a learner. We have to teach people. We have to teach them the complicated things about the faith, and we don't even begin to scratch the surface in a public sermon. Wiser, worship, instruction, service, evangelism, relations. All of these are spoken by Jesus when He says, Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. And then He ends with the words that ring through the church to this day 2,000 years later, and will stay with us like Jesus to the very end of this age. Follow me. But I want you to notice where all of this is taking place. Today, on the first Sunday of communion, where John doesn't even have the last supper, but he has the last breakfast on the beach, they are not in church. They're not in the nave. They're not in the boat. They're on the sand. That's why every narthex, every instrument, ours, ours is sort of red, but the brown, we always color the narthex as a brown sandy color in church architecture. Why? It reminds us that that's the beach. We're coming out of the boat and we're on the land and now we're going to go do ministry. Peter jumped out of the boat into the water and the disciple who loved Jesus because they were looking for Jesus. They were trying to find where he They weren't fishing. They were waiting for God to show up again. Churches have to look for where God is and what God is doing and then go follow Jesus there, outside the nave of the church, outside the sanctuary. The Bible says that they were only 100 yards away. Do you know what's 100 yards away from us? The first Sunday I got here, I walked from our very far parking spaces. Every church has far parking spaces. Explain to me sometime why churches have far parking spaces. If Subway had parking spaces like this or McDonald's, McDonald's would say, well, you can simply park over at either the Wise Guy parking lot or Walmart and walk on over here. It makes no sense to me. It is 100 yards for our ladies to walk from that parking lot to their pew. What's 100 yards from where we're sitting right now? Matthew, next week, is going to finish up cleaning. He's worked so hard, our neighbor on beautifying our property next door. The National Day of Prayer was 100 yards away or more at the park, and we brought it here. But the thing I've noticed about God for Hampshire Colony, I don't know if you've noticed this, is He keeps bringing the outside inside. We had two, this, two services last month. This entire sanctuary was packed from Vio de Cristo services. We have the Cotton, cotton Patch Gospel tonight. The Kids Club, which started out with just five little girls. Do you realize what else started with five kids? We're doing this trivia thing, so I've got notes on there for next week. Zeering Child Care Center started here with five children, and now look where they are. Don't despise the small things, the Bible says. Buddy bags. This place is packed every week. 
the First Presbyterian Church, our sister church, same size as us. They have people here almost every day at our church to be a part of the Buddy Bags packing. The scouts and the other young lambs who come to help us, like Drew Wallace, who's been trying to mow our yard so beautifully. The historic tours want to come here and bring people. And the architect in town, um, um, Studio K, Ryan and uh, Steve, they arranged for the, archi- the history people to come here because a lot of people in town don't even know this is Owen Lovejoy's historic church. And then the People's Church, of all places, asked to come here. They asked me if they could use our beautiful exterior as part of their, what do they call it, um, when you go around hunting for things, um, scavenger hunt for Valentine's Day. So all their couples had to stand under our beautiful porch with the lights glowing in the darkness from the inside out, and they had to take a picture of them standing in this beautiful church. All these things God does to bring things within just 100 yards of us. Jesus is not limited to who or what is inside our beautiful boat building. The church, as I said, is not a membership organization. It's actually, Romans 12 is where the world gets that term member. But then the world doesn't understand what we meant by it, and they miss the point. The church is the only organization created for people who are not members. So as we go out of this boat and head into the sandy shores of our week, let's keep our eyes like, John and Peter looking to see where Jesus is and then go follow him there. Would you please rise and join me in singing our closing hymn, number 318, Jesus Comes with Clouds Descending. Please receive this blessing. The God of all creation says in His Word that He receives glory by showing you grace, by demonstrating His love in you and in the church. Go as full ambassadors of God's love, as channels of God's love, and as instruments of God's love in the world where you walk today. Amen.